Good morning, all of you. I'm, uh, I'm just glad to see every one of you this morning. I'm thankful that you're here. Oh, glad and, to see you. Well, thank you. I just appreciate you being here on Sunday mornings. It's an encouragement to uh, have a congregation to preach to. Um, and uh, just want to thank you for your faithfulness and uh, your attendance this morning. This morning we're going to uh, finish out the 15th chapter of Romans. It's the start of the conclusion of the book of Romans. So what I've listed up here is just a, a simple outline of the concluding topics from chapter 15. And Paul will talk about the past and his plans for the future. And then uh, he will have a request of prayer on his behalf. And what we see in... Uh, this and we could we could go over it very quickly if we wanted to, but that that would be a shame because so much of the character of Paul is revealed. We see uh, his humility, his tenderness, um, just so many attributes about Paul that that come out in the closing uh, chapters, fifteen and sixteen of the book of Romans. So I want to start out just reading, starting in verse fourteen together. Paul says, I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. Some of your translations may say to admonish one another. Instruct and admonish are the same thing. Yet I have written you quite boldly on some points to remind you of them because of the grace God gave me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. He he gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I, glorify, or I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done, by the power of signs and wonders, through the power of the Spirit of God. So from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, that's wrong, Illyricum, Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known, so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. Rather, as it is written, those who were not told about him will see, and those who have not heard will understand. This is why I have often been hindered from coming to you. But now there is no more place for me to work in these regions, and since I have been longing for many years to visit you, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. I hope to see you while passing through and to have you assist me on my journey there, after I have enjoyed your company for a while. Now, however, I am on my way to Jerusalem in the service of the Lord's people, for Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the Lord's people in Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them, for the Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, they owe it to the Jews to share with them from their material blessings. So after I have completed this task and have made sure that they have received this contribution, I will go to Spain and visit you on the way. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the full measure of the blessing of Christ. I urge you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Pray that I may be kept safe from the unbelievers in Judea and that the contribution I take to Jerusalem may be favorably received by the Lord's people there so that I may come to you with joy by God's will and in your company be refreshed. The God of peace be with you all. Amen. So to start off with, Paul talks a little bit about his ministry and its purpose. Uh, Paul was a minister to the Gentiles. That was what God called him uh, to be. Um, Paul 
was one that liked to plant churches. He he was, I guess, what you would think of as a, a frontiersman, spiritually speaking. He he wanted to go where no man had gone before. Uh, if you watch Star Trek, why that might mean something to you. If not, he why it doesn't. Reminded me of Johnny Appleseed. Johnny Appleseed. Going along with planting an apple tree. Yeah, it, it, it was Paul's mission. It was Paul's desire, and it was certainly his duty to go and spread the gospel where it had not been spoken of before. Now, that, that's not to say that Paul didn't go and follow up, because we know in our study of Acts that Paul did go and follow up. He made three different uh, missionary journeys, and in each of those, he would meet with Christians who uh, had received the word of, of Christ before he came, or even after he came, um, he would see those that he had visited Proceeding in the preceding uh, missions. So Paul starts out this portion of the letter in concluding the book of Romans, and he, he says that he is convinced that, and he addresses the, the Roman church as brothers and sisters, as a term of affection, that you yourselves, that being the Roman church, are full of goodness, filled with knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. If you remember way back in Romans chapter 3, Paul makes a point to tell us that no one is good, not even one. He tells us, he tells the Roman church and he tells us how wretched we are in the flesh. But yet here, Paul tells them that he is convinced that they are full of goodness, filled with knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. Now, how is that possible when Paul has stated previously that that's not the case. The Roman church, just like us, uh, this is something we have in common with all Christians throughout the centuries, are filled with the Holy Spirit of God. That's how they are full of goodness. That's how they are competent in knowledge. And that's how they are able to instruct one another. There is nothing special about Alan Tipton and his ability to preach, the words that, that are supplied to me every Sunday come from, I believe, the Holy Spirit. Because I go back and I watch the, the video as I put it on, on YouTube, and I think, how on earth did, did I speak that way? Because it's not at all like I had planned out in my head. And, and that's how the Holy Spirit works. He works through us. And that's part of what the Apostle Paul is praising God about. He says, he says he has written quite boldly on some points to remind them. Well, we know up until this point, the book of Romans has just been full of doctrine, especially the doctrine of justification by faith. He has pounded us over the head with the idea that we are saved because God has imputed salvation to us and righteousness has been bestowed upon us because of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. And Paul simply, I think gently, points out that, hey, I just kind of jabbed you a little just to remind you about some things that you might be struggling with in your church. And, and that's what the job of a minister is to do. Uh, I'm not to get up here and brag on all of your spiritual work, but rather I am to convict you that, that what God has given you is a gift. And that gift is not to hoard, it's to share. And so that's what Paul's doing here. He, he says, I've written you quite boldly on some points to remind you of them again because of the grace God gave me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. Remember, Paul was given his gift of ministry. He, he was out on quite a different mission when we read about him in the book of Acts. He was Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor of the church. He was a killer of Christians. He imprisoned them. He tortured them. He was in opposition to the way. But Jesus directly encountered him on the road to Damascus 
and changed him into the man he is. Now, it wasn't an immediate transformation that Paul became the Apostle Paul. Um, we know that there was a time when uh, he was uh, by himself with Christ for three years and was instructed uh, spiritually by the Holy Spirit. And when it was all said and done, Paul's mission, his his job in Christ was to be a minister to the Gentiles. Paul says, he gave me the priestly duty, the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. The Gentiles were not God's chosen people. They they had to be changed. They had to be sanctified. And that's the process that we are all in, the process of sanctification. We have all been justified. We are, we are clean in God's sight because of what Christ has done. But now through the indwelling Holy Spirit, we are going through the process of becoming sanctified. And anytime you're struggling with an issue of sin, you're going, to, you're going to wrestle with sanctification because that little, that little uh, whisper in your ear or in your mind that tells you what you're doing is wrong is the Holy Spirit working on your conscience, working on your heart, helping you become uh, pure in your relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and Paul looks at his duty, the job that's been given to him by Jesus Christ, as a priestly duty. Now I want to ask you this morning, do you feel like as a Christian in Putnam County, your priestly duty is to proclaim the word of God to your friends and neighbors and your relatives right here in this county? I'm going to guess that just like me, you feel like the answer is no. That is not my priestly duty, but I want to assure you that it is your priestly duty. That is what God has intended and commissioned each one of you and me to do. It's to share the gospel. It's our priestly duty as if we were part of the Lev Levitical line, as if we were a descendant of Aaron. We are to act as a kingdom of priests within our community. Paul says, therefore, I glory, I boast, I'm bragging in Christ Jesus in my service to God. Because of what the Holy Spirit has done through me, because of the work that Jesus Christ is doing in me, I, I glory in Christ Jesus. I'm willing to share with you the successes. I'm willing to tell you about it. But I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. You notice Paul didn't say, I will not venture to speak of anything that I have accomplished. No, it's what Christ has accomplished in Paul. Again, we see the humility that Paul is trying to express to the Roman church. I will not speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God. Paul, as a minister to the Gentiles, was, was up against uh, some real resistance in preaching to the Gentiles. The Jews knew who Jehovah was. They knew who the one true God was. The Gentiles did not. Paul was dealing with all kinds of paganism. And, and it would be quite a barrier for Paul to convince the Gentiles that there was only one God because many of them were uh, pagans and they believed in many, many gods especially the Greeks and the Romans. They, they believed in a multitude of gods. But Paul had the privilege and the work ahead of him to, to preach that there was only one true God and that through his son, Jesus Christ, salvation could be achieved. 
And we know as Christians that that is a hard sell. It was a hard sell then, it's a hard sell now. The world tells us there are many ways to heaven. But we know that's not true. There's only one way. And that's through Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul was up against. But but think about it. Think about going into a place where no one had ever heard about Jehovah. No one had ever heard about Jesus Christ and trying to preach that message that would have been uh, so at odds with what they believed to be true. And that's yet what Paul uh, loved to do. That's what he was commissioned to do. And in order to make his ministry valid, Paul says that he was to lead the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done by the power of signs and wonders. Signs and wonders through the power of the Spirit of God. Now, signs and wonders are miracles. Paul was given the ability to perform many, many, many miracles. I want you to understand that what we have recorded in Scripture is just a glimpse into the miracles that Paul did in Christ Jesus' name. Everywhere he went, his ministry was validated by the power that he was able to share through the power of the Holy Spirit in healing people, in exercising demons. Uh, well, one of my favorite scriptures is, is uh, Jesus healing the man with the, with the uh, arm that was damaged. And, and Jesus said, just stick out your arm. And, and he did, and it was immediately turned into a, a full working uh, limb. It was a man with a shriveled hand. And, and Paul did things just like this. Everything, everywhere he went, he, he did miracles through the Spirit of God. So Paul says, from Jerusalem all the way around to Elycrium, I have, I have practiced that word and practiced that word, and I've still struggled with it. Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. Paul's basically saying from the east to the west, to the, to the known Roman world, I have proclaimed the gospel of Christ. I have, I have faithfully executed my duty as a missionary to the Gentiles. And he says, it's always been my ambition, ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. You know, it took a little, I'll just be honest with you, it took a little bit of time for me to feel like that this was my ministry because I followed Dan Todd, because I followed uh, preachers previous to me that you were used to, that had invested in you. And it took a couple, three years before I felt like I'm the Church of Christ's minister. I'm their preacher. And, and I think that's maybe part of what Paul's talking about, although Paul was, again, a frontiersman. He was, he was boldly going into areas where the gospel had not been shared. And when I got here, I, <laughs> I received a congregation of of people who were already saved, that were only uh, needing continual edification. Um, now, we've had some baptisms in our young people since I've been here, and I have loved that. I, that, that has been uh, a, a real blessing. And we've had some adults that have been baptized here, some that, that aren't even members of this church that were baptized here. Uh, and, and that's been a blessing too. And that's that's what we're here for. We're here to fellowship together, but more than anything else, we are here to produce converts. That's our job, to produce converts for the Lord. And Paul always went to preach where Christ was not known. Um, we have the example in, in uh, Acts of where Paul went and preached and then Apollos watered. Paul planted, Apollos watered. And Paul would 
would plan a ministry, get it going, and then someone would come and oversee that. Timothy does that for Paul in, in various churches, particularly in Ephesus. So Paul says, rather, it is as it is written, those who were not told about him will see, and those who have not heard will understand. Now that's prophecy from the prophet Isaiah, which is found in Isaiah chapter 52. And this is uh, material that you're familiar with. Isaiah 52 through 56 is prophecy about the suffering servant. It's what we point to when people say, well, there's nothing mentioned about Jesus in the Old Testament. And we say, really? <laughs> let's, let's go to Isaiah 52 through 56. And this is what... Uh, this is what Isaiah prophesies about Christ. He says, see, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Now, how was Christ raised and lifted up? Three ways. When you think about him being raised, lifted up, and highly exalted. First of all, he was placed on the cross. He was placed on the cross for the very purpose of dying. Dying to put our sins uh, to, to rest. He, he died to sin. Then secondly, he was raised or lifted up out of the grave. He was resurrected three days after that. And then thirdly, he was highly exalted. He ascended into heaven and he is at the right hand of God now. And so Jesus has fulfilled those proclamations that Isaiah said about him. Just as there were many who were appalled at him. How were they appalled at him? Jesus was beaten beyond recognition. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being. His form marred beyond human likeness. Now I have seen some pictures that are troubling on the internet. Um, women who have been abused by their husbands that have been beaten so badly they they can't open their eyes and their faces is just a, a swollen pumpkin I, I just want you to think about the, that kind of enemy and i'm sure you've seen similar ones just like that but that's what jesus looked like after he had been scourged and beaten and scorned uh, he was marred beyond human likeness if you were to look at him on the cross hanging there and look at his face, it would have been hard for you to determine that that was a man. That's how badly he was beaten. Verse 15, so he will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. What does, what does Isaiah mean by he will sprinkle many nations? Well, that's the term of atonement where Jesus made atonement for our sins. Moses would go in with blood that was blessed through the priestly process and he would sprinkle the altar with blood making atonement for sins. Jesus sprinkles you and I and all the nations of the world with his blood making atonement for our sins. And here's our verse that Paul quotes, for what they were not told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. And so, so Paul, if you want to, if you want to say, if, if someone wants to come to you and say, well, Jesus isn't mentioned in the Old Testament, you point them to Isaiah 52 and, and share that with them. And then you can see, not only is he recognized in the Old Testament, the very prophecy that was written about him is recorded in the New Testament as well. I about lost it. This is why I've been often hindered from coming from you. I've been doing ministry, folks. That's what Paul says. I've been busy teaching those people who have not heard about Christ. And, and now they know. And that's why I haven't come to visit you. I've been busy with ministry. But now there's no more place for me to work in these regions. Since I have been longing for many years to visit you, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. Now, Spain is way out west. 
and there is no biblical record of Paul ever visiting Spain. So did he? Well, we don't know for sure. There are some texts that say that Paul visited the very far reaches of the West. I believe he did. Um, before he came to Rome and was imprisoned. When, when Paul goes and visit, actually visits the Roman people, it will be three years after he writes this letter. And he will come in chains. He will come in chains. He will be a prisoner. I hope to see you while passing through. His, his plans are to go through Rome and go up to Spain. That's not how it works out, though. And to have you assist me on my journey there after I have enjoyed your company for a while. So Paul's planning on staying and fellowshipping with them, but more than that, he plans to have the Roman church be a partner with him in his missionary effort to Spain. How will they do that? Well, there's a lot of ways in where you can partner uh, with a missionary. First and foremost, you can be a financial contributor to a missionary. But I think secondly, and just as important, is that you can daily lift that missionary up in prayer and, and pray for them. That's, that's as important as it is to support them financially. Now, however, I am on my way to Jerusalem in service of the Lord's people there. And he's getting ready to explain something we've talked about before. The folks in uh, Thessalonia, in Macedonia and Achaia, they have they have they're very poor, but they have collected an offering to send back to the home church in Jerusalem that's suffering because of a famine. Now, however, I'm on my way to Jerusalem in service of the Lord's people there for Macedonia and Achaia. We're pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the Lord's people in Jerusalem. They were happy to do it. These are poor people that are happy to be able to contribute to the physical needs of those in Jerusalem. And he says, and indeed, they owe it to them. The Jews shared their spiritual blessings with the Gentiles. Uh, how did they do that? Well, for, for, one, for one thing, they sent out Paul. Paul was under uh, guidance from the church in Jerusalem, and he went out and shared their, his, uh, his spiritual message with them. And he says, For if the Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, they owe it to the Jews to share with them in their material blessings. So after... I have completed this task and have made sure that they have received this contribution. I will go to Spain and visit you on the way. I know that when I come to you, I will be in the full measure of the blessing of Christ. But now Paul humbles himself once again in his writing and he asks for their prayer support. That's the last thing we're going to cover this morning. I urge you, Brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Do you ever view your praying as a struggle? Jacob wrestled with God. Paul struggles with God. We've talked about this before, but it's hard to be faithful. It's hard to be a Christian in this world. And our, our prayers should be full of trembling and fear. When I, when I prayed this morning, uh, it was a struggle. I don't know why, but it was. It was, it was hard getting my mind right uh, to share with you all this morning. But being focused on that and being determined to be settled in my mind and in my heart, it happened. But it was hard. It was hard to, to get my focus. Paul's specific prayers are, first of all, pray that I may be kept safe from the unbelievers in Judea. The Judaizers were in 
uh, incredible opposition to Paul in Jerusalem. Uh, they've even had to try. They've even tried to have him killed once. So he's he's up against a lot, and he's getting ready to go back into hostile territory again. And so he's asking for the Roman church to pray for his success. And that he can take that contribution to Jerusalem may be favorably received by the Lord's people there. He has the worry that the Jews will reject an offering from the Gentiles. And he wants prayer that their hearts would be open, that they would receive this blessing from the churches in Thessalonica and and have their material needs met. And, And Paul's hoping that this offering will be a mending or a a significant uh, progress toward the Jews and the Gentiles becoming one instead of being two separate factions in Christ, Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. He wants the, the, the wall of hostility to be torn down between them. So pray with me that I be kept safe from the unbelievers in Judea and that the contribution I take to Jerusalem may be favorably received by the Lord's people there so that I may come to you with joy by God's will and in your company be refreshed. That's the last thing he asked for. That by God's will I can come into your company and have a time of fellowship. And that's not how it happened. Just like we talked before. This is what Paul prayed for, but that's not what happened. God had other plans. He brought Paul into Rome as a prisoner in chains. And then Paul closes his, his request or the end of this paragraph with just a lovely sentiment when he says, The God of peace be with you all. Amen. Or so be it. Or shalom. Um. The God of peace be with you all. I hope that you all pray for each other that way because we're up against a lot in this world. We we need each other's prayers to overcome our fear of rejection among our friends and our peers, our relatives, when when we try to share our faith with them, because ultimately that's that's what we're here for. I know I say that all the time, but we need to be in prayer for one another and pray pray for me that that I can have peace. That that when I share my faith or when I share with you that that I'm effective and relaxed and and open to the Holy Spirit's leading. Um, we all need to be in prayer for one another. I pray that the peace of God be with you all this week. Let's let's pray together. Heavenly Father, again, we just thank you for the opportunity to uh, study from your word, uh, just to glean some truths from the scriptures, to understand exactly what the Apostle Paul was going through during this time period. And, and Father, I know that some of what we're going to study this week and a couple weeks following will, will be pretty straightforward, uh, but help us, Lord, just to be encouraged by Paul's words to understand that uh, uh, he is uh, praising Christ and uh, wrapping up a, a great letter that we've enjoyed studying so much. Um, Father, I pray for each one of, of these saints that are here this morning that they would enjoy the peace that comes from a relationship with you and your son, Christ Jesus. I pray, Father, that the struggles that they have, whether they be physically or whether they be physical struggles or emotional struggles or mental struggles, that, Father, you would give them relief, that you would give them clarity, that you would give them rest. Uh, Father, we all we all need the peace that only you can bring to our lives. I pray, Father, that uh, all of us would would focus on that peace that's available because we live in a world and in a time where it seems like peace is uh, a secondary virtue and it needs to be primary in the life of a Christian. 
we need to be at peace with you. We need to be at peace with our neighbor. We need to be at peace with our family. And sometimes, a lot of times, that's all going to be on us because our neighbor isn't receptive or our family member isn't receptive. But so far as it is in our power, as you've said in your scripture, as it applies to us, we must seek out to have peace with all men. And so I pray that would be on our hearts and on our minds this week as we go our separate ways. Father, bless this time of communion that we're about to share together. I pray that we would be able to focus our minds and our hearts on that scene on Calvary where Jesus went through so much, endured so much, and, and we tend to focus on the physical, but Jesus went through so much emotionally. And I can't imagine, Father, the, the struggle that he had in his mind as he freely gave up his own life for the sins of others. You love us so much, and I pray that we appreciate it. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.